Okay, welcome everybody. Let's get started. And the topic for today is compliance. And here's a scene from Paper Moon, a movie from 1973 I would highly recommend. And it has a lot to do with uh, this uh, lecture today in that uh, the Paper Moon was about two con men, or a con man and a con woman, uh, who uh, went through uh, the uh, Midwest during the Great Depression conning people. And uh, as we'll see that uh, these compliant techniques are very important to uh, confidence men. So uh, the overall topic this week is social influence and a lot of students will say the term peer pressure but uh, peer pressure is a vernacular term uh, we use the term social influence and we break that down into even smaller parts. We talk about conformity, conformity to norms, group norms, obedience to authority figures, and finally we talk about compliance. And so what is compliance? Well, uh, what we're going to talk about today is the definition. We're going to talk about compliance professionals, uh, compliance principles and techniques and then we're going to talk about uh, the survivorship bias. Okay so uh, compliance is just the submission of somebody to a request that is I ask you to do something and uh, you do it or you don't do it. It's your decision. Uh, so compliance is kind of different than authority and obedience. Uh, however uh, with compliance, what we're really talking about are the compliance principles and techniques. And applying these principles and techniques increase the probability that someone will submit to a request of yours that is somebody will say yes. Uh, and compliance techniques are used by everyone, but compliance professionals are people whose lives or livelihoods depend upon uh, compliance uh, principles and techniques people such as salespeople. That is, in sales, uh, you are trying to get someone to say yes to buying something, and you're using every uh, technique and principle that you know. Uh, politicians are trying to get you to vote for them, to say yes and vote for them. Religious leaders are attempting to get you to say yes, uh, I've been saved by X religion, and uh, I'll certainly uh, you know, uh, put some money in the offering plate. And then finally, con men. Uh, and it uh, upsets a lot of people that I would group these four uh, different uh, 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 you know, uh, vocations together. However, they all are compliance professionals in that they all are dependent upon getting people to say yes to them that is to uh, say yes to requests that they make. Uh, when we talk about uh, compliance principles and compliance professionals, Robert Saldini, a uh, social psychologist, his name always comes up. Uh, he's done a great deal of research. In fact, he worked as a used car salesman for two years uh, to learn a compliance profession. and. Uh, uh, with that uh, applied experience and also with his uh, research experience, uh, he uh, developed uh, these basic principles of compliance. And so the first principle is friendship and liking. That is, uh, oh, I actually have a slide for each of these, so I only have to list them now. Second is cons uh, commitment and consistency, scarcity, reciprocity social validation and authority. Okay, so let's go through the principles one at a time. Uh, friendship. Uh, this principle is about getting people to comply by either creating an actual friendship or implying that a friendship exists. And so uh, what you're doing is to try to get people to say yes to you or to comply with a request what you're going to do is you're going to make friends with them or you're going to imply that you have a friendship. And uh, look at this, look who my friend is. Woo! Yep, uh, back in 2008, 
uh, you know, when I was, uh, uh, when uh, Senator, uh, no, this is from uh, 2012, when President Obama was running for uh, re-election, uh, I contributed to the campaign, and I received uh, uh, emails stating, friend, uh, your friend Barack, and, uh, you know, I'm friends with uh, Michelle Obama and Joe Biden, by the way, so I have lots of friends and get these emails saying that friends, my dear friend Bill, could you, or they say William, uh, could you, because that's the name I give when I give them money, uh, could you give us a little bit more money? So uh, in some way, creating a friendship or actually implying that a friendship exists when it may not really. Liking, uh, getting people to like you. And one way to, uh, get people to like you is to uh, create positive affect in the target person that is good a good mood and there's two different ways you can do that one is that you can do it uh, directly by causing positive affect that is doing things to make that person feel good uh, the other way is indirectly uh, that is you could be associated with any positive affect that exists that is uh, being there uh, you know, with a person when uh, you're doing some positive or fun activity, you will be associated with the positive affect the person is feeling. Uh, humor is a uh, uh, you know, embodiment of this principle in that uh, telling jokes and making jokes and making somebody laugh uh, certainly will create positive affect and make people like you more. Uh, consistency and con, uh, commitment. Uh, people generally feel bad not honoring a commitment. And so uh, one principle in uh, you know, compliance is to get people to make a commitment as quickly as possible. Uh, and so once they made the commitment, even if they didn't think it through, and then they think it through and they realize it's a bad commitment, even though they know it's bad for them, they're still going to go with it uh, because they've made the commitment and people uh, have this drive for consistency and one way they express their consistency is if they make a commitment they follow up to it. Uh, another uh, and then uh, consistency people wish to be and or appear consistent uh, that is attribution theory is based on the idea of you know cognitive consistency that is, people like to have everything wrapped up in a nice, you know, tidy knot and bow. And so people are driven to uh, not only be consistent, that is, have a life that, uh, you know, is free of cognitive dissonance, uh, but also appear to people as a consistent. And uh, back in the campaign, uh, you know, uh, the Obama campaign set up a little, like, account for me. And they would remind me, well, you know, you uh, you gave $50 last month, so this is a new month. So are you going to be consistent or not? Another principle is scarcity. Uh, reactance is the drive to feel that you are not controlled by anything. That's a basic psychological drive to feel that you have free will. And so whenever anything tries to take away your sense of being able to choose whatever you want, uh, reactance is created and you feel motivated to do something uh, to uh, you know, make sure that you still have choices available to you. And when something is scarce, when time is running out, when a product is running out, reactance causes people to uh, you know, make decisions and to do things and to say yes because they want to avoid that situation where they have no choice because that is a disagreeable situation to them. And so uh, you think about the last year or so how people have gone crazy about toilet paper and again because you want to have, you know, and it's not that toilet paper is not available but you want to have your choice of your special brand and if like your special brand is sold out and there's only that cheapo uh, industrial toilet paper uh, left, you're going to buy it and use it, but you're not going to be happy. And that's reactance. And that's because you no longer have a choice of your special toilet paper. 
and well, I mean, that sounds silly, uh, I am motivated to have my special toilet paper. Uh, and this is fantastic. Uh, you know, politicians always do this. Maybe you're seeing a lot of it uh, now during the uh, campaign. Uh, we have a deadline coming up, an FCC filing deadline, and we want to raise so much more money before the deadline, and that's tomorrow night. So uh, can you give $25? Well, okay, there's a deadline. Uh, that will cause reactants, and so a feeling of sick, uh, scarcity, so I'll uh, make want to make a donation. But uh, what is this FCC deadline? Nothing. It's just that every couple of months you ha the campaigns have to report to the FCC how much money they give. And then once the clock ticks over to 12.01 a.m., you start another quarter, and you can uh, collect as many donations as you can. So what they're doing is they're creating a false or a imaginary deadline in order to uh, ramp up people's reactants. Uh, reciprocity. Uh, this is the idea that uh, people want to have clean accounts with each other in terms of owing things or being owed. And so if you do something to me or you do something for me, excuse me, I feel like I need to do something to you. If you give me a present, I feel I need to give you a present. Uh, if you help me out, I feel I need to return the favor. And that's what re reciprocity is, returning the favor. And so anything uh, you can do uh, to uh, create a situation where people feel in debt would really ramp up their desire to do something back to you. Uh, back in 2000, and this was 2008, uh, before uh, you know Barack announced who his VP would be, uh, you know I got this email and it said, "Hey, do you want to be the first to know? Just sign up here, and we'll text you like a day before we make the public announcement, or an hour before we make the public announcement, to let you know who it would be." And so I did that because you know it's there for free. But now they're giving me something; they're giving me this extra information, this gift. So don't I owe them something? Don't I owe them some money, maybe? And, you know, we like to reciprocate in the same kind, but if you can't, then any type of channel is appropriate. So if I can't, you know, give back to them in the same way that, uh, you know, they gave to me, I can always give them money. It's the second best thing, but it's still uh, something uh, important. Uh, so that's reciprocity. Uh, interesting story. Uh, back about 10 years ago, I was working with the PSC, the, the teachers union here. And believe it or not, we didn't have uh, you know, uh, you know, maternity leave for faculty members. So if you were a, a, a female faculty member and you were pregnant, you had to take sick leave. Uh, and so we were trying to get petitions signed uh, for uh, faculty maternity leave. And it was, uh, and here's what uh, the, the chapter decided to do. It was Valentine's Day. So they got a bunch of lollipops that were heart-shaped, individually wrapped. And we were out at the atrium, and we had our sign-up sheets there to sign the petition. And so what they told us was, okay, so try to get people to sign a petition. If they sign it, give them a, a lollipop. And I knew that this was perfectly backwards. And so what I did was I went up to people, I gave them a lollipop, and I said, here, the PSC wants you to have a lollipop for uh, Valentine's Day. Oh, and by the way, and I would hand them the clipboard, uh, we would like you to sign this uh, petition just asking for faculty to be given maternity leave. And, you know, at the end of my two-hour shift, they were like, how did you get all these signatures? You have like a hundred, and other people have four or five. And it's because I knew what reciprocity was. And finally, social validation. Uh, as the name applies, this principle is you get people to say yes, uh, because saying yes validates them socially. It validates them socially by saying you are conforming, you are part of the group, you're normal. So 
uh, you know, if you say yes, this is just evidence that you're a normal person, uh, but also social validation could be uh, information that you're superior. That is, well, you know, uh, only uh, people of a really, you know, high class, uh, you know, upper income bracket would buy this model car. So if you want to show people that you are a member of that social class, then you should buy this car. And so that's what social validation is. And, and true to form, the Obama campaign uh, at the 2004 convention, uh, you know, Barack spoke about help. Uh, across the country, two million donors owning a piece of this campaign and uh, that's social validation in that if you want to be a part of our group you should give money and own the campaign and be a part of this cam campaign and you'll be uh, you know validated in our little social group okay finally authority uh, and yep true to form very important in the 2000 was it eight campaign uh, you know at one point, Barack pulled in this guy, this famous guy, this president, to help him out with his campaign. And why do, an authority does help, an authority does work as a, a conformity principle. Why is that? Uh, well, uh, it could be for informational influence. Uh, that is, uh, if the uh, you know, authority figure is seen as an expert or if they're seen as credible, uh, then the authority figure is an informational influence. That is, they're giving you information that somebody who knows what's going on is choosing this. Uh, or it could be seen as a normative influence. Uh, that is, uh, basic Milgram uh, obedience. That is, uh, this guy here is a authority figure, and he's saying, vote for this guy. And so you do it because obedience, obedience to authority, simple as that. Uh, or you could look at it uh, as ingratiation, which we'll get to in just a minute. Uh, that is, this guy here is trying to ingratiate with us by hanging out with this guy here. Okay, I've been talking about compliance principles, which are general concepts. Uh, of how people, uh, you know, get people to say yes. You know, for example, my idea with the lollipops, you know, that was not written down in a book, that was not a formula, I just realized that's what I needed to do. And that's what principles are. We're going to be talking about compliance techniques, which are uh, specific procedures for implementing these principles. Okay, so uh, what we can do is we can group these techniques based on the different principles. And so let's first look at the techniques based on friendship and liking. And uh, the technique that's uh, mainly based on friendship and liking is ingratiation. And uh, oh, look at this. This looks like a Wikipedia page, and it is. And look what it says about the father of ingratiation is Edward E. Jones. That was what he was famous for before he went on to uh, you know, the fundamental attribution error. But what is uh, ingratiation? Okay, so what is an ingratiation? Ingratiation is attempts to make people like you. Uh, and uh, you know, if you want to call that in the vernacular sucking up or kissing up, please go ahead because that's what exactly what it is. And uh, Jones talked about different, oh, different categories of it. Need my pen. Uh, and identify these categories. Uh, complementary other enhancement. That is, you're enhancing the target of your uh, request beforehand. You're buttering them up with compliments. So it's the act of using compliments or fl flattery to improve the esteem of others. And it could be direct in that you say, oh, I like your haircut. Uh, or indirect, where you tell Sue, oh, you know, I like so-and-so's haircut, 
and Sue's a blabbermouth, so she'll go and tell the person, oh, Bill likes your haircut. Uh, or you could give them favors. And, uh, you know, I said, I was talking about reciprocity before. Isn't doing favors reciprocity? Yeah, it is. Except Jones is talking about when there's no help of reciprocity. And so what Jones felt was that uh, people would see uh, this situation where, you know, it's obvious that I can't pay you back. I'm doing it. Uh, you know, you're doing this for me because you really like me and you really think I'm special and you want to help me. And that's going to really complement my self-esteem. Uh, another way to ingratiate is conformity with the target. Uh, that is, uh, think about opinions, judgments, behaviors. Uh, you know, and so you show the target person that you have the same attitudes. You have the same opinions. You behave in the same way. Uh, and you could do it a couple different ways. You could directly uh, say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I am against Trump also. Oh, he's so horrible. Or you could allow them to convince you of what their uh, attitudes are. And not only will they now feel a sense of similarity with you because uh, you have the same attitudes, but now they'll feel that they've helped you uh, or that they're really great in terms of their debate skills and that's going up to doing things to improve their self-esteem. Or a very basic way is mimicry. Mimicry is when we speak and act in ways that are similar to the targets. And people uh, do this naturally. We naturally tend to start to talk and act the way others do. Uh, and uh, you know, once you learn how you're doing it, you can uh, do this more self-consciously and uh, actually try to you know, pick up the behaviors because uh, people tend to like other people more if they act or talk the same way they do. And so mimicry is one way to illustrate conformity with the target to ingratiate yourself with the target. And finally, there's self-presentation. Uh, that is, you want to impress the target with how great you are. So self-promotion, you will talk about your you know, achievements and your uh, you know, successes. Uh, you will name drop. Well, you know, Bill Clinton wants, me, wants you to vote for me. Uh, you know, you'll name drop famous people you know or important people you know. Uh, and so you could do that, the very direct route towards self-presentation, to making yourself seem like a really great guy. Or you could take a more subtle approach and be modest and self-deprecate. Oh, you know, you're such a great, uh, you know, uh, you know, guitar player, and I'm just horrible. I tried, and I just really can't under, you know, can't really get that. But you're fantastic. I just, I just can't do it. And uh, instrumental uh, dependency, uh, where you either orchestrate it so you actually are, or you imply that you're uh, at the, you know, dependency. You're at the, uh, you know, uh, at the need of the target person. Oh, you know, I couldn't get by this class without you. Thank you so much. Uh, you, literally, if it wasn't for your notes. I would, I would flunk, and I just really need you. And again, uh, that is a more modest way of basically uh, presenting yourself uh, and doing so in a way which will increase the person's uh, liking of you and their willingness, therefore, to help you. Moving on, techniques based on commitment and consistency. And the first is called the foot in the door effect, uh, because, uh, or the foot in the door procedure, uh, because salesmen would actually do this. They'd ring the uh, door to door salesman would ring the doorbell. People would open up the door and they'd see it's a, a salesman and they start to slam the door and they'd stick their foot in the door, and prevent you from shutting the door. But the way this works is you make a small, really trivial uh, request first. 
and then later on you hit them with the target request. And so uh, if you could change the font on the report, that's trivial. You just go on you know, to Word and you just click font and change. That's trivial. But then later on, now can you go through the report and proofread it? Boy, that's a big request. That's what they wanted you to do. Asking for the small request first is going to increase the likelihood that they'll do the target request. Why? Uh, consistency. You already said yes to them. once and so to be consistent you have to say yes to them again another commitment and consistency uh, technique is lowballing changing the deal after an agreement of course we all remember from Star Wars I am altering the deal pray I do not alter it further and uh, that's classic lowballing maybe but uh, Lowballing really is adding hidden things in an agreement or bringing out the hidden things in an agreement after the person agreed. So the classic example is, uh, you know, you are a car salesman and you get somebody to say they're going to buy the car and you get, you know, you've agreed on uh, $35,000 and you're talking to them and you're showing them the contract and everything and now it says 36 and uh, they say wait a minute you, we said 35 oh yeah but the extra thousand is for uh, the dealer uh, the factory authorized uh, you know uh, paint tinting to prevent it from UV damage it's automatic well I didn't say I wanted that well it's automatic so you know all cars have it so I don't know what to do so uh, you've basically uh, paying an extra thousand dollars for a seventy-six dollar UV treatment, and that's what lowballing is. And again, whoop, I should go back. It's commitment and consistency because you already said yes to the deal, and even though the deal has been changed, you should continue saying yes. Just be consistent, and you made that commitment. Uh, also, peaking. Peaking, uh, that is getting somebody's interest, uh, you know, uh, peaked, uh, is one way, way that you can gain compliance. For example, isn't this interesting? Doesn't this pique your <laughs> interest? Why in the heck do they have such weird hours? And uh, again, this is a consistency because now you are asking yourself why and now you're going to be thinking about this and wanting to interact with them in order to find out why and so that's what how peaking can draw you into a situation where you are uh, saying yes to coming in or yes to getting more information so peaking is another consistency based uh, technique. Moving on to reciprocity, uh, the door in the face method. Uh, what you do is you ask a realist, uh, unrealistic, uh, excuse me, an uh, unrealistically large request first, and then oh, you can't see it it's under the uh, cartoon, uh, your target request, and that's what Calvin is trying here. Mom, can I set my bed on fire? No. Can I ride my uh, tricycle on the roof? No. Then can I have a cookie? No. And Calvin says she's on to me. And this cartoon is about the door in the face uh, technique because that's what Calvin is trying to do. It just doesn't work on his mother because she's used to him. Uh, but you give an unrealistic uh, you know, request first that you know people will automatically turn down, like setting the mattress on fire. And what does that do and what does that have to do with reciprocity? Well, uh, because they said no to you, they feel like they owe you something. Uh, and so because they owe you something, when you give them the target request, uh, they may or may not do it normally, but now that since they owe you, they feel more impelled to actually do the target request because they owe you something because of reciprocity. 
the that uh, the net well, the that's not all uh, technique is also based on reciprocity. It's adding benefits before a person makes a decision. But wait, there's more. And yes, so I'm trying to sell you a car, and uh, you know we're getting close to the agreement. You know you're interested in this car. We're around thirty-five thousand dollars, and you you know uh, the uh, you know uh, customer hasn't really decided. They're on the fence, and so the salesman says, "Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll throw in uh, UV." protection tinting for the paint job for free. That's normally a thousand dollars, but I'm going to toss it in for free. Now, why is that reciprocity? Because the uh, you know salesman has given you a gift, this for free, and so therefore you owe him or her something, and that something could be repaid by saying, okay, yes, I'll, I'll buy the car for $35,000. And techniques about scarcity, playing hard to get, uh, suggesting that a goal is scarce or difficult to obtain, that is whether you're running out of time or uh, there are other offers on the table. Uh, the most uh, sophisticated man says, I don't usually mention other job offers doing an interview. Just kidding. I always mention them even if I have to make them up. And that's because you're playing hard to get. Uh, you're trying to tell one job that, oh, you know, you better hurry up because if you wait too long, somebody else is going to grab me. And so this is definitely based on scarcity. Or, you know, uh, you uh, want to impress uh, someone and they ask you out for a date and you say, well, you know, I'm kind of busy that night I'm doing something with somebody else uh, maybe later on in the week and uh, that would get them to see that oh you know going out with you you know other people are going out with you so that would get them uh, to be more interested in developing a relationship with you and then another technique based on scarcity is uh, the fast approaching deadline uh, that is, you have a deadline coming up, or there is some type of, uh, you know, uh, scarcity involved so that something happens. And so, this ends in 18 minutes and 47 seconds and 50 milliseconds. And so, there's a limited time to take uh, advantage of this special offer for the stand-up George Foreman grill. And so, what does that mean? If after 18 minutes do they stop selling this? No, they keep on selling it. Uh, you could probably talk them into the uh, discount, uh, but they're just putting it up there as a technique to get you to buy now. And let's see the next slide. Uh, one more technique. Uh, you know, this technique is based on authority, uh, and it's the mind reader technique. Uh, I know what you're thinking right now, so let me tell you why you think it will be worth it. That is, giving the impression that you understand somebody else's perspective, that you can read their mind more or less, uh, that creates a sense that you are an authority or you're an expert, and so people will tend to trust you more and comply with your offers. And I believe, yes. Uh, that is the end of this first half of the lecture. Uh, come back for the second half uh, when compliance to authority goes wrong, and uh, I'll see you then. Bye-bye.